So tonight, this presentation is called Artificial Intelligence and Music. And uh, the goal here is not to really do a deep dive in either of the directions too far, but instead to give a general overview of where we might see artificial intelligence applied to musical applications today. Um, and also give you enough musical background so that we can understand how music can be used as input to modern artificial intelligence algorithms and systems. So um, on that note, I know we have a lot of people here with a variety of backgrounds. Some people are musicians who have never coded in their life. Uh, some people are uh, coding experts with a uh, hobby of music. And some people sit somewhere in between. So wherever you're coming from, um, hopefully you can grab onto some of the ideas we talk about. And please ask questions as we go. So on that note, my first thing tonight is to try to get everyone to think a little bit more like a computer as we look at these, uh, these different systems. So this is really um, what I think is the, the core functionality of AI right now is this middle part, this function. Um, we're trying to ask the question of, is there a way to represent a function of something we see in the real world um, within a computer? So with a vision system, this might be, is there a way to recognize um, what is going on in the world around us? If we take an input image, can we output a label for that image? Uh, for music, maybe we're looking at a, at a Mozart symphony and we want to know if we give an input of a Mozart symphony, can we output that this is indeed by Mozart? Um, in case of generative models, which is a fancy way of saying uh, composition for these music applications, can we take an input of the, the last note of Schubert's Unfinished? And can we output what we think might have been the next note? So um, as we think and see these applications, try to imagine um, what the input might be, what the output might be, and what function um, we're learning to figure out how to make these connections. So here's our big uh, look at what is artificial intelligence. Right now, uh, there are a lot of buzzwords that fly around every day on our news feeds that have probably at least two of the terms we're seeing on this bubble to the left. And it gets a little bit cloudy um, for, I mean, for me doing research in this field, and I'm sure for everyone reading about it, what exactly these mean. And even between articles, the, their uses might vary. Um, so the, the key thing for artificial intelligence is this is not necessarily a deep learning machine learning system. This is just any uh, technique or system that can let a machine do something that a human could only do previously. So this doesn't necessarily mean that we have a giant statistical model or a ton of data. It just means, can we replicate a human activity? Machine learning, on the other hand, uh, this is the, the really hot field where we're taking lots of data and we're um, giving it to an algorithm so that it can try to learn a process that a human can do. And um, as we go deeper into this field of machine learning, we hit uh, what I think is really fascinating, artificial neural networks. This is basically uh, humans asking, can we replicate our brain inside a computer? And so the process is in our brain. And can we use this to give us the output? So we're switching now from a mathematical model to kind of a bio-inspired model, which is really exciting. And then deep learning says, can we take a brain and make the biggest brain possible in the computer? And this is where we start to hit the limits of current uh, computational power. Uh, we're starting to hit time constraints. We're starting to hit memory constraints. Um, but really, this is the closest we're getting to modeling what's actually happening in our brain in these processes. So here is, if we go back and imagine this, uh, the, the kind of light green bubble called machine learning. This is the standard process we'd expect for a machine learning system. Um, we're going to feed it a bunch of training data which is real world examples of whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. If we're trying to teach a robot to write a symphony, we're going to feed it a bunch of symphonies. Um, then we train the machine learning algorithm, which basically says, let the computer do whatever it has to do to generate its own model of what that data is. And typically this is in what we call a lower dimensional space. Um, if we imagine a, uh, let's go back to a Beethoven symphony. There's a lot of things at play here. Um, if we're imagining the notes on the page to start with, uh, there's the, the shape of every note, uh, there's the dynamics, there's the pitches, there's the instruments, there's all these different parameters. Um, but the question is, is there something at its core that makes a Beethoven symphony a Beethoven symphony as opposed to Mozart, Brahms, Price? Um, and so a machine learning algorithm typically tries to reduce the, this giant dimensional space into something more compact and understandable. Um, so from that, we get this trained model. And over to the left, we can give input data, which would be something that the model hasn't seen before. So if we are teaching a machine learning model to write like Beethoven, 
we would train it on Beethoven's nine symphonies that we have. And then maybe we find a manuscript from just before his death with the uh, first three bars of what would be his 10th symphony. Ideally, we could pass this into the model and say, model, can you make something that sounds like Beethoven from this theme? It would give us a prediction. Um, if it's, and maybe we have some feedback. If it's good, we can improve the algorithm with it. If it's bad, we can still improve the algorithm and say that wasn't quite right. So this is the machine learning process. Um, now, Sorry, if we take- Sorry, Ross. Sure. Um, um, before you go on, would you mind um, minimizing your little Zoom windows? Um, yes. They're because uh, we're they're just blocking part of the slides. Um, so is this better? Just... So is that even right. better? The top one is gone, but now there's something in the middle. Okay, that's better. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, right on the same track where we were. If we're going back to machine learning. Um, these are some of the different problems that we address with machine learning. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and just focus on these upper two called unsupervised and supervised learning. We're not going to worry about reinforcement learning right now. That's a system for rewarding an algorithm for doing well, which is not really what we'll be doing with music tonight. So we have unsupervised versus supervised. And all this means is with the data we give the system, um, does the data come with its own labels, with its own human um, assigned properties? If it's unsupervised, that means we don't know anything about the data. We just know that this is music data. So with this, uh, we, we're limited in the tasks we can do. Um, for example, we can cluster the data. If I give you a, a, a big tub filled with all the manuscripts of the 20th century composers, perhaps we can cluster it and say, OK, these three pieces are really similar. These five are really similar, and these six are similar. But if I don't tell you the name of the composer, you can't tell me the name of a new symphony if I pass you one of their works. Um, same idea here with dimensionality reduction. We're just taking a big uh, symphony and we're converting it into a lower dimensional space. But if I don't tell you exactly what those attributes are in the symphony, you can't really tell me, oh, this is a dimension that represents the um, dynamics around the piece. We need labels to do that. So that brings us to supervised learning. And this is when we have um, data about the thing that we're uh, classifying, uh, regressing. And it's really just a question of how, what type of data do we have for our model. So uh, keep these terms in mind as we move on here. And this here is now my favorite part of the presentation. Um, these are neural networks. So for anyone who uh, is a biologist or a psychologist or has taken some um, learning in that field, you probably recognize what we're seeing at the top left here as uh, being a neuron from our brain. And the, the basic idea biologically for this neuron is that these dendrites are going to receive some kind of stimulus. Could be coming from a neuron, could be coming from a different type of um, motor receptor in our body. But either way, there's going to be some kind of chemical or electrical activation on those dendrites. And if that activation is enough, the neuron's going to send an electrical signal out through its axon terminals. And uh, the brilliant idea that some computer scientists had a while back was what if we made one of these inside a computer? So we take in inputs, which would just be like a stimulus we encounter in the real world. And if the sum total of those stimuli are enough, then we'll go ahead and send an output from this, um, from this neuron. And one of these, sure, represents maybe just a basic program with if we're getting input A and B and C, then give output C, uh, D. But if we attach all these together, we get an image like what we see on the top right. So this is a neural network because it's a giant interconnection of all these neurons. Each circle here, you can think of it as being one of these circles here. And all these outputs are all the different connections, all the axon terminals to later neurons in the field. And what we're doing when we're training a neural network is we're just looking at this inner part, this circle. And when we say uh, bias and we see the summation here, what we're actually doing is we have these weights inside, uh, weights or coefficients, however you like to think of it, for a giant math equation. It's a giant linear combination of input uh, one times some weight plus input two times some weight plus input three times some weight plus some bias. And when we train, we're just finding a way to change those weights so that they can represent the actual system um, that we're trying to model. Maybe that's learning a symphony. Maybe it's learning how to make an instrumental timbre that we've been trying to find. And so this here, this equation is called the, the back propagation equation. And this is how we uh, train those weights. We say that the old weight is going to be changed 
by some learning rate that we decide times the amount of um, error accounted for by a change in that weight. And from that, we generate new weights as we go. And basically over the course of hours, days, weeks, whatever your training time is, we can teach a model like our brain to remember something. So um, let's finally start tying this back to music. And I threw uh, Carmen Sandiego on here because I've been binging a little bit too much on Netflix. But let's go ahead and use the chat or unmute your mics. Uh, let me know when you think we might have found some of the earliest examples of artificially intelligent music, a system that is uh, mechanical or mathematical in nature, but replicates what a human might be doing. And I gave uh, four decades and a lot of context hints. Uh, some of these are red herrings, but uh, see if you can guess when we might see some of these first systems. And since I am terrible at Zoom, uh, can someone on the SSA board who is looking at the chat tell me what our majority seems to be? All right, Victoria, Isaac, Gabby, can someone save me? Do we have any answers? So I think most of our answers are like after 1800s. Cool. Okay, so I, I'm going to guess maybe that we're looking at these uh, when the computers were invented and uh, using that to inform our decision. And I'm going to surprise everyone and say that the, uh, the choice today would have been, whoops, the 1750s in this case. So uh, this is what we'd call an early stochastic process um, to create music. And in 1757, we have the earliest example of, in German, the Musikalisches Würfspiel, um, or musical dice game. And the way this was created was um, a composer went and wrote uh, somewhere around 140 to 176 uh, musical cells, where each one is just a bar of a piece. And then uh, the system was that you would take a pair of dice or some other random process, maybe you're throwing a dart, and pick which cell to put next in your piece. And um, what I like about this as an early example is it gets to um, two key ideas in artificial intelligence, which is that things are determined by probability and randomness. When we roll the dice, we have a uh, one in six probability of each roll or one in 12 if we're rolling two. Um, and we also have this, this randomness to each new composition we generate. So um, yeah, if you look up this term, you might see it um, attributed to Mozart, but we also can find examples that predate his, uh, his composition years. So it was a popular bar game back at the time. And what's also cool is if we're talking about a low dimensional representation of a giant uh, mathematical space, we look at these, uh, these grids on the right, and we can see there's 144 options. And from that, we're making, uh, I don't even know what magnitude this is, but let's say 45 quintillion different waltzes. So uh, that's the power of these neural networks. By having all of these, uh, these spaces reduce this low dimensionality, by just giving a slightly different random input, you can create an entirely different piece. So uh, this brings me to my next question, which I'd like us to unmute mics for just since I can't use chat. But uh, the question I want to ask is, what is music? And uh, I'll acknowledge that there's no real answer to this question, but I would like it to help us think like a computer for the next hour. Um, so what do we think if we had to define music to tell a computer what music is, what would we tell it? I think to distinguish music from just noise, it would have to be sounds in a variety of pitches. Mm -hmm. And it could be the same rhythm or it could be different rhythms. So I think pitches is most important. And do those pitches, would you um, say they have to vary over time? Yeah, over an extended period of time. Not okay, so we have a time element involved, a pitch element. Is there anything else happening for how we define music to tell a computer? 
a stable pitch? Okay. No. Yes, I think, yeah, I think, like, I think, Gabby, I think also, like, um, the right pitches have, are relative to each other, so there has to be some relationship that mm -hmm. defines what is a pitch in the first place of, between, not, that's not just frequency, um, but like a, but a specific relationship between two pitches or two frequencies to create a pitch. And if I were to give you a, uh, a book of piano sheet music, is that music? I guess you can <laughs> I heard no and yes. Anyone want to defend an answer? Um, I guess my answer was yes, because you can use that as like a notation to create the sound, which mm -hmm. would that be what I define as music. Yeah, I think if we're going to use the computer as a creative process to create music, I would argue that, that the notation itself is also music because we're asking the computer to create a different version of that. Yeah, um, so I think we, we kind of hit on all the main points I wanted to touch on, and forgive me if this, if this is covering things again. Um, there's, there's two main definitions of music we'll kind of use when we look at these models. There's music as the sound itself, which is a physical property that we can measure in a microphone. It's, it's the sound waves as they change, the airwaves. And we can also view it as a set of performance instructions, or as we would more readily call it, sheet music. That notation is itself a valid form of music and something that we can generate using artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm going to click on this sound link here, and hopefully you guys are following me to Chrome Music Lab. Uh, is this showing up or is it still on the slideshow? It's showing up. Great. So I just want to look at a few things here. This is a tool that Google put out. Uh, thank you, Terry, for sharing it earlier this week. And I think it uh, does a really good job of illustrating a couple ideas for those of us who haven't seen it before. Um, so the first I want to look at is what is a sound wave. So if we imagine all these blue dots are um, little air particles that could be going in our ear, uh, they could be whizzing around the room, they could be going into my microphone right now as I speak. Um, this is one of our favorite definitions of music, it's just wiggly air, right? Um, so if we look, all that's happening when we're sounding the sea is that there's this pressure wave going through all the particles. And if we go up to a higher sea, the air wiggles faster. That's just what we'd call increased frequency. And if we go even higher, it wiggles even faster. So um, all that a microphone is, is it's taking this, this wiggly air and uh, trying to give it a computer representation for us to use. So now we can look at a spectrogram. This is another important tool for analyzing sound. And we can see the similarity between the notation we'd expect to see an upward scale and these red bars moving up. So all these red bars are, these are showing us the, the most dominant frequency appearing at the time of the sound. Um, and I'd like to show the computer version. Nope, not that one. Let's look at this wine glass. Um, so what's different about the wine glasses spectrogram versus say, the trombone spectrogram. Anything jumping out at people. Feel free to unmute if you have some ideas or thoughts. The overtones? Of yeah, the, the overtones, exactly. So this is um, one thing that we have to be careful of when we process a spectrogram. Sometimes the note we care about is the very bottom one. Sometimes it's the collection of all those overtones together. And the collection of the overtones that varies between instruments is what gives it the unique property we call timbre. Um, so we'll look at some artificial intelligence to create new timbres and explore existing timbres in a little bit. All right, so we did our two definitions of music. And now we're going to finally look at a few examples of actual artificial intelligence used to do things. Um, so the, the first one I think would be easiest to understand would be in the context of pop music. Um, so if, if we go to hooktheory.com or guitartablookup.net, we can find the guitar, um, the, the chords for nearly any pop song that we've heard on the radio in the past century. And uh, we can think of these as being a probabilistic process. Uh, if you hear a C major chord on the radio, the next chord you hear is probably not going to be F sharp minor. 
Um, so there, there's an inherent probability and structure to these. And we might also say that within a single genre or a single artist, we might expect the same chord progressions to appear throughout the music. So um, there's an interesting data structure called the, the Markov model, which proposes that the uh, next state of any system depends only on the previous state. Um, now, obviously, there's a few problems in this, right? If we have a long uh, flow of music, like a symphony or a piano concerto, uh, the next note clearly depends on more than just the previous note, because uh, things change over long periods of time when we're dealing with long pieces of music. But with pop music, this can sometimes be a good representation, since things tend to be a little bit more repetitive. Uh, things tend to be only in these four note groupings, and you can usually expect the same patterns to appear over and over again. Um, so on that note, uh, this, is, this is the Markov model, and I have an example here with cloudy, rain, sunny, but you can imagine in your head maybe this is a one chord, a five chord, and a four chord. And this is just describing the interactions and how likely it is to go between those different uh, chords as we go. There's a variant of this called the hidden Markov model. Maybe we don't have the chord tab, maybe we just have a recording. So the question then becomes, can we take the sound we hear with the non-chord tones, the noise, the singer's own ornamentations, and guess what chord was internally represented? We call that a hidden state. So there's a distinction here between what we can observe, the output sound. Are we walking? Are we cleaning? Are we, I don't know what this last one is, it's covered right now. Are we shopping? We can probably guess what the weather is based on what we observe. And we make an assumption that the internal state is affected um, by its own process, but we can observe something that comes out from it. So um, for anyone following along with these Markov models, if we're going back to this idea of composing a Beatles hit, and I take all of the Beatles uh, discography, take their chord tabs and put it into a Markov model, what challenge might exist if I'm trying to make my own Beatles hit starting from scratch and I want to start with an F major chord? Um, if we think about the data itself, what problems might appear? Anyone who's a musician is probably uh, able to catch what could happen. Any ideas? There, there's no wrong answer. Well, you've, you'd only have chords, right? You wouldn't have a melody. Sure. Um, what if we're just trying to do the chord progression? Let, let's start with that. Would you end up having the same progression like over and over again? That is the first big problem you'll hit when you use Markov, exactly. If it's only dependent on the previous uh, chord, then it's going to get stuck in this loop. We do have to add a little bit of randomness or the, the spiciness to the model, right? Maybe if uh, instead of choosing the most probable next chord, we choose at random um, between the options and we weight those options with their probabilities that we've observed. That's, that's a great point. Um, let's, let's zoom in on the Beatles for a second. Uh, let's pretend the Beatles were, were very uh, vanilla musicians and they only used uh, one flat or one sharp maximum. And I want to start my piece in E flat. What problem do we have now? The problem is this key might not exist in their data set, right? And uh, we should have a way to account for this. And the term we use when we're dealing with um, training machine learning models, we call this data augmentation. How can we take the data set we've been given and add to it without losing the character of the original data? So when we're talking about chord progressions, a really easy way to do this is just to transpose. If we have the progression F, B flat, C, F, transpose it to D major, D, G, A, D, and add that to your data set. We didn't lose the chord progression. It's, it's the same progression. Um, but we were able to expand it now, so our data covers a larger set of possible states. So that's another big idea we can think about. Uh, the next slide is, uh, this is just one example of this. Um, so what this composer did is they made a Markov model, and they're using it to represent uh, two chords per measure of their piece, and they gave it a melody. So they gave it one extra input. It's based on the chord that came before it, and the last note that the, um, of the melody that the model heard before it. And we'll just listen to a minute of this clip to hear what the composer created. No, we will not. I could not click the video. There we go.
so I think Victoria nailed the uh, the main thing that makes this music a little bit slow is it's the same thing over and over again, right? These Markov models tend to get stuck in these patterns, even if you add a little bit of probability. Um, but what is cool is that this, uh, this actual project uh, takes the melody notes and then transforms uh, the, the Markov model to make a harmonization for the melody, which is really interesting. All right, so that was AI to uh, compose a Beatles hit. What if we wanted to compose the rest of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony? Um, so a cool thing about symphonies, uh, let's just take Beethoven 5 that everyone knows, for example. Um, we have recurring motives that appear throughout, right? With Beethoven 5, it's the idea of uh, three things, then one thing. And we see that in the rhythms, we see it in the melody. And um, with, with Schubert, let's go ahead and make an assumption that there are some motives hidden in the first two movements of his symphony that he might have liked to put into the third and the fourth if he had finished it. Um, so to approach this, uh, there were uh, two computer scientists, Lempel and Ziv, who created the incremental parsing algorithm. And they actually first used this in speech instead of in, um, in music. But the basic idea was the same. Um, if I am giving you a sentence, um, Victoria is from France, therefore Victoria speaks, it's really important that you hear the first half of that sentence to know that she speaks French as the final word. So we need something that has this longer persistent state and can collect uh, data from earlier on in, in the data you give it. So there are two key components to the incremental parsing algorithm. First, you have to find the motifs themselves. Um, and for those of you who are not programmers, this is what we call pseudocode. It's a way of uh, reading uh, computer code for humans. So this, this is a little bit uh, worded confusing, but the idea is every time you find a new element you haven't seen before, uh, treat it like it might be the start of a motive and save it somewhere in the computer. Uh, second, we take all these motives at the end and then go back over the data set one more time and count how many times these motives appear and more importantly, count what they usually follow. So from this, we create this uh, really cool chain that can connect long flowing ideas in music that are not just a single note, it's an actual full phrase. Um, so with that, I am going to actually play an example of using um, Lempel and Ziv's incremental parsing algorithm on a piano piece. Um, this is something I generated from a MIDI file. And I want you to guess what the piano piece is and see if you can hear any of the, the longer motives using this algorithm. there. Any guesses? We got some, is that some Mozart or is it Beethoven? It's Beethoven. Any pianists want to name the piece? It sounded like a for Elise. That was it. Yes. And if we go back and listen to it again, I won't play it for you right now, but you can hear the chromatic figuration that E D sharp and you can hear that big stride, the A E uh, A that appears. Uh, so they both make their way into this uh, computer composed piece, which is pretty cool. And this is really not that complex an algorithm. There's no giant deep neural networks for this. It's really just looking at the data and organizing the motifs. Uh, the next section here, we have AI to create lo-fi MIDI tracks. So this is kind of along the lines of the pop music we looked at earlier. Um, so what are some properties of lo-fi for anyone who listens to it that makes it soothing, good to study to, good to take a nap to? Um, we kind of touched on this earlier. If anyone wants to reiterate the points, feel free to unmute. What makes lo-fi lo-fi? There's a constant beat under it. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of, I guess, environmental noise. Mm -hmm. Like there's always, yeah, some kind of droning effect to make you like lull, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there's some kind of element of repetition that soothes us, right? It's not so jarring and, and filled with events and new things that, that we uh, lose our focus. And so uh, one thing that we can use to get this idea of um, 
repetition but still reliance on a previous state is called a recurrent neural network or an RNN. And if you look at this left side here, we have XO, A, H, O. That's your traditional neural network. It says give input, feed it through the network, and let the network make some guess, H, O. And the idea behind a recurrent neural network, which makes it great for time series data, like music, is that what if we pass the output of the previous state into the next cell? So that the next cell depends not only on the current environment, like Gabby mentioned, but also on what happened in the previous environment. And if we connect this giant chain, what we end up with is this nice H O, H1, H2 through H T. We get this full piece composed. Um, so Google has a project called Magenta, and they use this to develop their own AI music algorithms, and they have a lo-fi player there. And as soon as it loads, we'll just listen to a little bit of this, and this is built on a recurrent neural network. Come on, internet. Here we go. And what's cool about this tool, if anyone wants to play with it later, they have all these different parameters of the network output that you can change. You can change the instrument, volume, swing, all these things. Um, so yeah, this is built on recurrent neural networks. A small demo. Now, the question I have is, do we think we could use the same kind of model that makes lo-fi to make a tone, tone poem? And why or why not? I don't know. I mean, um, the specific example, uh, it sort of reflects the graphic. It does sound a bit 8-bit. Uh, the mm -hmm. characteristic is very 8-bit, and it works for a lo-fi, but I don't think it would translate as nicely for a symphonic tone poem. Yeah, that, that's a great point. So the input representation makes a huge deal. Um, if this model is only learning how to synthesize MIDI data, uh, MIDI being uh, we know the note pitch, we know the instrument name, and we know how hard that pitch is hit, it's going to be kind of hard to create these long flowing effects like a dynamic swell across an orchestra or a, a specifically orchestrated timbre of a French horn and a violin. We can't really um, work with all these parameters that we'd like to. And the, uh, the other bigger issue is that with a recurrent neural network, we actually lose some information along the way. So by the time we're 30 seconds into the piece, even though we're saying we've passed the data from um, the beginning all the way through, Notice that it's being filtered each time through this process A. So by the time the information that was encoded in the beginning in X0 makes its way to influence the decision for the 30 second um, measure of the piece, it's been filtered a lot and a lot of the information is actually lost. So there's a different neural network structure that we use uh, to address this called the long short term memory network. And I am not going to explain this, uh, mostly because I don't think I can right now. Um, this LSTM model, if we look inside, there's a bunch of these little gates in here. And uh, in short, what it's doing is it's choosing when to pass data from the earlier portions, um, kind of as a bypass directly to the later layers. And uh, there's a problem in machine learning called the vanishing gradient problem, which uh, basically says that if you, if you train, um, you can hit the situation where the model stops learning because the data being input uh, at later layers of your model can't create an effect where you can tell what effect the data has. The, the effect is so small that it gets buried in, in the later layers. So the LSTM, Long Short Term Memory Network, helps overcome that by passing information from earlier times directly to later times. This is great for things like tone poems and symphonies where you want this long-term develop, long development of a musical idea, not just a, this is the next bar, this is the next bar, this is the next bar. All right, another really cool area, this is called the autoencoder. And this can be used to create brand new orchestral sounds beyond the instruments that we usually listen to. So what I have up here is actually a image processing version of an autoencoder. And what do we notice about the input versus the output? They are exactly the same drawing. So the idea behind this network is, what if we took, uh, we'll call this guy Bob, and we passed Bob through all these neurons, 
and got him down to this two-dimensional representation where only two numbers represent the entirety of this Bob drawing. And then we train the other half of this network to take those two numbers that represent Bob and by doing a bunch of math on it, recreate the Bob drawing. So what this effectively does is it learns to map the input to exactly match the output. Now we might think this is useless at first because if I have flute data, I don't want to recreate flute data. I already have flute data. If I have clarinet, I don't need to recreate clarinet. I already have it. Um, but what's interesting is if we take these two data points in the middle that we talked about and view them instead as being two points on this infinite plane uh, down here where it says hidden. So if we view these two points, maybe the flute, um, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Cool. So maybe the flute sound is located right here on this plane with its 2D coordinate. And maybe the clarinet's located over here. And maybe the violin is over here. What happens if I take a sample from between the flute and clarinet and pass it through the decoder? I'm going to get a brand new drawing, a brand new sound that I've never heard before that doesn't exist in the real world. So the idea is we take a lot of instrumental sounds and create this rough outline of what this uh, 2D space might be and then start sampling it at places that don't exist in the real world. And what happens when we do that is really exciting. I'm going to play some of these for you. Um, so here's, the, they actually turned it into a 3D space, not a 2D. But if you see these data points, these are the actual sounds from the orchestra instruments. So uh, I don't know which ones these are. I see piccolo labeled here in green. So maybe the piccolo is hanging out over there. We got the French horn in pink over here. Let's pretend blue is a violin. So there's a lot of empty space here that we can sample to try to find new sounds. And if we listen to some of these, um, so this is an example of whoever wrote this program, they're sampling from wherever the bassoon is located all the way to where the clarinet is located. And here's what's generated. Or maybe they go from French horn to trombone. Those ones are a little bit easy. Woodwind to woodwind, brass to brass. Let's do something more exciting. How about we go, uh, bassoon to cello sounds exciting. Or English horn to violin. So what I hope you all heard is that there was a timbre change happening here and halfway through each of those, sure, we started at English horn and ended at violin, but the sound in between was a brand new sound altogether that doesn't exist. Um, so that's the cool thing about we can, we can uh, use autoencoders to create these timbral spaces. All right, so that's the autoencoder. Uh, the next slide, and this is the one that Isaac and I were talking about before we started here. This is called uh, the Generative Adversarial Network, and the best way to introduce this is through probably my favorite artificial intelligence demo ever. Um, this is a picture of a cat, and this is an image processing problem where we try to guess uh, what image is being shown by passing the image to a neural network. And this might be a little bit small for people to see, but the neural network output is here, and it's guessing with about 85% um, likelihood that it thinks it might be a tabby cat. And it thinks uh, that maybe 10, less than 10% that it might be a tiger that it's looking at, and then about, what we'll call it 5% that it might be an Egyptian cat. So if we pass this image instead, um, first through a model called a, a GAN, a generative adversarial network, and then give the output of that model to the same classifier, can anyone read what the, what the computer now thinks this cat is? Feel free to shout it if you can read, otherwise I'll, I'll spoil it with my voice. What is the cat? Guacamole. It is guacamole. And this is clearly to a human not guacamole, but now every computer that sees this cat will think it is guacamole. And not only does it think it's guacamole, nearly 100% sure it's guacamole, with a second choice being maybe broccoli or maybe mortar cat is nowhere on here anymore except for this very tiny frame uh, down about number seven in the rankings. So how did it do this? Well, what it does, uh, if we look at this diagram on the left, we have these real world examples labeled X train. So that's the real cats. And we pass it to this thing, uh, this D block called the discriminator. And the discriminator is going to compare the real sample of the cat to one passed through this block labeled G, generator, 
And the generator is learning to create versions of the cat that trick the discriminator into thinking it's something else. So we're balancing two different uh, training routines here. We're trying to train the generator to create something that looks vaguely cat-like. And we're also simultaneously training this discriminator to um, try to pick out the real from the fake. So how does this tie back to music? We can use it to trick uh, computers into thinking things are not what they actually are. Um, but what about something like Spotify that's listening to uh, audio from a microphone and it's trying to guess what song it is using both the, the actual song data that's coming through and any noise in your environment? Well, what if we could pass a slightly modified audio where we still hear it as being a song we know and love, but the, uh, the computer thinks it's never going to give you up every time it hears it because we sprinkle in just the right amount of noise in the right places. That's the idea behind a GAN. And there's some really cool research happening at UCSD right now, uh, which is taking this idea of uh, these phantom listeners hanging out on our cell phone conversations or wherever it is that we're scared someone's listening. Uh, what if every time they listened, we gave them a uh, noise added to the data that turns that audio transcription into stop listening to me. You know, something, something fun to let them know that we, hear, we know that you can hear us and we're gonna block uh, the actual meaning of our sound. So GANs can also be used to generate compositions instead of just uh, tricking people. And Google has done some work with this, again, with their project Magenta. We can take a quick listen. Um, so what they did with their GAN model is they tried to use it to generate timbral spaces, just like we saw with the autoencoder. And the idea uh, behind this is, can we create uh, sounds that sound just like the orchestra instruments we love that actually came from nothing, they came from mathematical randomness? Can we trick a computer into thinking that it's a real sound from an orchestra instrument that it's heard before? So I'm gonna play wherever it is. Uh, let's listen to a few of these synthesis, synthesis, synthesized versions. Um, so first I'm gonna play the real sound. We got a piano. And then I'm gonna play the two previous state-of-the-art reconstructions of that piano. So that sounds like a terrifying movie soundtrack. And then we'll listen to Wave again. Again, not quite right, but let's listen to GAN synth, Google's latest. Is it perfect? No. But is it a little bit closer to the piano? Yes. Um, and the reason these are so hard to recreate, kind of like Gabby pointed out earlier with these overtones, look how complex these sounds are. It's not just one single frequency it's learning. It's learning how to handle all these frequencies that exist above it at a single instance. So let's listen now to the most beautiful example of this working. Uh, here we go. This is going to be uh, fully constructed using instruments that don't actually exist. And as the model progresses, it's going to change which timbre we're listening to. I'm going to pause it right there because that was probably the craziest part for me to listen to. Did we hear the human voices pop in? Listen one more time. So again, none of these voices actually exist. They don't have a data set that says male voice singing G. All, all they have is some random numbers and they feed it through the model that trained on some male voices singing a G, and we're able to create that output. So that is the, uh, the basic GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. And uh, at this point, I'd like to show a few examples of AI being actually inserted now into human spaces where we usually perform. So I have four examples here, and uh, Carmen Sandiego is back because one of these performances is fake, and I'd like you to guess which one. It might be obvious, might not. Um, but let's just go through a few of these. We'll listen to a couple minutes.
I don't know about you, I don't think I could follow any of the gestures from the robot conductor just yet, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and here we have some more AI generated music. music systems are awesome and here's another one this is a entirely robot composed song now and he's going to perform it for us So that's a uh, gospel in space by Shimon. And now he's going to rap for us in a rap battle. So one of the most exciting contacted dash into Mom thought he was one, but he can't be one. Cause I got the vocabulary off the top and I often rock, closing up shop. Take with your pulse vision, social indigestion. Ask attention. The solution is passing by. We are the servants of the world's for the world's showing aim. Cause you're trying to make a claim. I want to be a human. You wanna be human, but you all right, so any guesses on what the fake was from these four? Victoria, do we have a chat consensus? Not yet. Teresa Pipe Dreams, and then someone said three, someone said second. Yeah, number two. Number two is about, uh, I think it's at least 15 years old now, a fake video. Uh, the, the description says that it comes from the University of Iowa and is on its way to the Smithsonian. It is a video. It is not actually a real system. Um, but the coolest thing, Shimon, is uh, from Georgia Tech. There's a whole lab dedicated to developing uh, AI that can be used to accompany, uh, AI that can be used to create its own songs. And uh, there's one thing, I don't know if anyone caught it in the Gospel in Space track. Did you notice that the drummer's right arm had a third drumstick? I'll try to go back to that moment. Actually, I'm not good with my meeting control, so I won't, but we're gonna look at that in a second. Uh, that's more from this lab. Whoops, so one I of the most wanna start four videos at once. On is bringing Shimon Sings the project. Okay, here we go. Um, so the, the, these are some more uh, ways that AI has made its way into the musical performance space. And this is through teaching and helping, uh, reaching out to, to students and musicians who are, now have tools that they can use to create uh, music. So the first one is a cyborg drummer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and follow this one because it could not be embedded. But this is actually from the same lab that created Shimon the robot we just listened to. And um, this drummer here uh, lost his arm, but would like to keep drumming and is able to do that with the help of this lab. I'm just gonna zoom ahead to a little bit of him playing and maybe showing how it works. There we go. Comes down. 
That's why we decided to try to raise funds so we can do that. There we go. Your support will help us push the state of the art in human augmentation, leading to innovations that could change the lives of men. With your help, we would be able to develop a new... So th this uses AI in, in a lot of different ways. Um, mainly, th there's some image processing going on to look at his arm and see what the impulses are that he's trying to give to the drum. And we also see the robotic controller within the drum that relies on feedback, tactile, from the drum it's hitting to know when to give it another impulse. Um, and also, this is another really important point. This wouldn't exist without collaboration between the developers and the musicians. Um, because someone needs to inform <laughs> the person sitting behind that laptop, what the drummer is trying to accomplish when he's doing his art. Um, yeah, so th this is one example of AI reaching out to help. Um, we also have the Skywalker pianist here. They created the Skywalker hand, uh, named after Luke Skywalker's uh, replacement hand in the Star Wars uh, movies. And this is actually used now to play a piano. I need to focus. This is crazy. Oh, no, no, no. Ever since I got on it and played the piano with all five of my fingers individually, it was completely mind-blowing. So those of you who helped me with Beethoven probably heard a similar rendition of Ode to Joy. Um, but yeah, very, very cool tech uh, helping people to continue making music. And in the teaching space, we have this virtual reality conductor. This is Jonathan Gerard from the University of British Columbia. And he uh, worked with some computer vision programmers to create a tool to help teach his conducting students. So the orchestra doesn't exist yet, but at least in principle, we got the, the podium and the, uh, the conductor standing here. And he can go in VR, pick up a baton, and he can start conducting. As we can see here, there's metrics uh, about his BPM. You can see his pattern. And uh, the real reason behind this invention was to get into the idea of 3D space. A textbook can't show you how far to reach. Just like when you're bowing, a textbook can't really show you exactly how to bow your instrument because it's only on a 2D flat surface. But if you have VR, you can get feedback now in this greater space. Um, and then there's other research happening on uh, performing during COVID right now, um, trying to figure out ways that we can interact with each other uh, through artificial intelligence in a virtual space and restore some of our performance capabilities that we uh, don't have right now since we can't meet in person. So on that note, I think this is my last slide. If I can get ahead. Yes. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Thank you to SSA for hosting. And I have a few recommendations if anyone wants to learn any more about uh, what we've gone over today. Uh, the first thing I'd recommend you to do is take the class CSE 190 here at UCSD. Um, we'll, we cover all the topics you saw in this class and more, and we cover it from the perspective of a musician, from the perspective of a programmer, and uh, all the spaces in between. If you want to just try to create your own compositions and, uh, and learn in, along the way, Google Magenta has an awesome playground of tools, which um, I'm sure we can get shared in the Discord also. And Amazon has created a product called Deep Composer where you buy a, uh, I think it's under $100, you get this keyboard and you can uh, start playing your own music. And as long as you're plugged into an Amazon server, it will compose along with you as you go. And of course, if anyone wants to reach out anytime, feel free to send me an email. Uh, on that note, uh, thank you everyone. If there are any questions, let's unmute and chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I just, I did have a question. Um, so could, do you know what's uh, for like the examples of artificial intelligence music that you showed us, the YouTube videos? Do you know which types of um, 
like are they using like a specific neural type of neural network or like uh, what type of learning like are they using like uh, uh, for which video uh maybe the bottom two for instance do you know what type of learning and artificial intelligence they're using oh for the uh for the shimo and the singing robot yes um i do not but that lab publishes everything they do really well um so i can send some links all about that uh, i would imagine there's a lot of different uh, neural networks happening at once because with these systems it's not usually one network answers all your questions it's one network addresses one question maybe a visual component one with audio one with the composition and then they're they're all married together um, to create this final output so i will send some of the links for them Ooh, very cool colleen I know Terry's been sending a lot of links this um, week. Also, Ross, someone has a question in the um, chat. Revisiting supervised versus unsupervised learning. Could you give a small end-to-end -end example? Um, sure, so if we had a uh, unsupervised system, um, maybe we want to know what chords we're listening to in a piece. Um, we want to know how they're grouped together, but we don't necessarily need to know what the chords names are. Uh, we could take that audio data and do clustering. So we could um, pass it into what's called a k-means classifier. And uh, we can find a way to take this data on this, let's call it a 2D space, and sort it into groups. And then we could look at which groups uh, each progression draws from. If we turn that into a supervised problem, we could do the same thing, but this time we would know the labels and uh, we could get a little bit extra information. So maybe we don't know what it sounds like, or we'll still know what it sounds like, but we can also now communicate that to a pianist and say the chords they played were C, F, G, C. Um, yeah, you're, you're touching on a really good question here of input space. So when, we, when I showed that slide about the two ways of thinking about music as sound versus as notation or instruction, you could do it either way. Um, we could pass it with the chord name, and in that case, chord identification would be part of your data set. Um, you could pass it as, if you have a full score in front of you, all the pitches that are sounding at once. And even then, it's not clear what the chord is, right? Because maybe there's a non-chord tone. Maybe it's a C major chord, but the clarinet's playing an A on top of it. So uh, your, your first layer could be the chord name, it could be the notes that are sounding, or it could be the audio itself. It could be the sound of the orchestra at that moment or the, the Beatles track. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is that the, the first layer in the network would, would be the, the sound or the representation. Yes, yeah, so I've looked at some um, some examples uh, in the past of like I think probably I think they're probably uh, like using like unlabeled data or whatever, where they try to to where they try to generate um, audio based off like what was played before. But I think if you're uh, so you you showed like um, like examples where you could have like the MIDI controllers or like have MIDI tones for the mm -hmm. for the notes. Like oh, at, at what level? Do you think um, like AI music currently is in terms of generating it from sound files, or what? What do you think is like the real the real minimum threshold to actually create good AI music? Yeah. Right so now? the the sound files MIDI in particular presents this really interesting challenge, which is it um, these time sequence data that we get output. It has to be relative to some scale. So maybe we output one note every. Uh, tenth of a second, and that represents a beat. So how do we represent something like a quarter note versus an eighth note? We have to pick a minimum viable note that we're outputting. Um, so that's kind of challenge number one. Uh, how do we pick the minimum so that we can learn everything that's relevant and, and convey that properly? Because if we're doing a bot corral, we only need quarter notes or eighth notes. Um, but if we're doing any piece with any kind of violin run, we need something at least to the 30 second note to have some kind of precision there. Um, and then how do you train the network to tie things over? Because normally we don't connect the output of individual seconds to the next second. We need a way outside of the network to say, oh, that was supposed to be tied over. 
and then um, make it clear that the output between time point one, two, and three is actually one continuous sound. Uh, so that's, that's another challenge there. Um, so MIDI representation is great for that reason of we can see what the pitches are at all times and we can make decisions with that. Uh, as opposed to the audio as input, because now we have noise, we have overtones, we have blending of sounds, and we can't actually extract information to create a composition. There, there needs to be some kind of transcription along the way where we can make it human readable, because uh, we can't read a spectrogram as, as, our, as a musician. Um, so I think you kind of hit the nail on the head where the state of the art is stuck between these two spaces. We can create really close sounding audio that a human can't perform if we use audio as input, or we can create uh, really clear performance instructions with as long as we take into account some challenges using MIDI, but it won't quite rival the true sound that we'd expect composed from a, a sound file. And I don't know if there's work being done to marry those two representations right now, or if they're just being handled separately. Um, is training data typically publicly available and shared? It depends on how nice the, uh, the users are. Um, there, there are a lot of great databases online. There's like a Charlie Parker jazz database. There's a bot corral database of MIDI files. There's a Pokemon database of all the Pokemon video game music um, as MIDI files. So if you do a search, you can probably find something that is in the realm of what you're looking for. But um, if you're looking for something very specific, you might need to create it yourself or find a way to transcribe it yourself. I think Google Magenta is pretty good about sharing their products when they are completed. Um, so that's a good place to look to start. Cool. Yeah, so if there's no further questions, um, I guess we can just thank our speaker, Ross, and, and I'll stop the recording now. And yeah, thank uh, you anyone all. who wants to stay on can just stay on the call. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, Ross. Cool, thank, thank you everyone. You. Thank you.